Today's case is one of the most upsetting that I think I've ever covered. So much so that while researching it, I just sat there with tears flooding down my face. If you've ever seen any of my videos before, normally I put the title as a psychological analysis of and then give the offender's name. But in this case, those sick, twisted individuals shouldn't get any kind of recognition, not even their name in the title. Yoko Furuta was a Japanese high school student who was abducted, raped, tortured and murdered. She was murdered in the late 1980s. The abuse was mainly perpetrated by four teenage boys over a period of 40 days from November 88 to January 89. The perpetrators were four teenage boys. The main perpetrator was Hiroshi Miyano, who was 18 years old. The other boys were 16 and 17 years old. I'm just going to refer to them from now on as boy A, B, C and D. That's how they were originally referred to in the court documents because they were minors. However, they were subsequently tried as adults and their names were released due to the nature of their offending. The main perpetrator, Offender A, was a member of the gang called the Yakuza. The English equivalent for the term Yakuza is gangster, meaning an individual involved in a mafia-like criminal organisation. It's a large organised crime group and is involved in all kinds of money and drug trafficking as well as a range of other crimes. It's a hierarchical group, similar to how the Mafia would operate with a number of syndicates within it. Many Japanese citizens are fearful of the threat that these individuals pose to their safety. At the time of their crime, they used the second floor of Mianto's house as a hangout. They'd previously carried out crimes including snatching purses off people, extortion and rape. My name is Dr Catherine Hughes, a criminal psychologist, and during this video I'm going to offer some insights into the psychology of the offenders. Obviously it isn't a diagnosis, it's an informed opinion. Although I do know a little about the psychology of organised crime, I'm not an expert in it. However, I do know quite a bit about the psychology of group behaviour. Also, there are many aspects of Japanese culture that I just don't know about. I think that's a really important note to highlight here. Often people don't acknowledge the differences in social dynamics and in social norms when e examining crimes such as this. But hopefully I'll be able to do this case some justice. Many thanks to Lauren Hawkins for suggesting this case for an analysis today. Junko Furuta was one incredibly strong young woman. She endured multiple rapes and extreme torture for 40 days before she died. In this first part, I'm just going to be describing the sequence of events that took place before moving on to examine the psychology of the behaviour. Normally, I wouldn't include graphic details of the crime itself. However, in this case, I do feel it is necessary to include it to give you a real insight into how sadistic the offenders were. Therefore, you must be warned that this video contains disturbing details of rape, gang rape, extreme torture, extreme sexual assault and murder. If you do feel sick or queasy when I'm detailing some of the crime or even slightly offended by the content, I will put a timestamp in the description box so that you can skip ahead and not listen to all of this. On the day that Junko Furuta was abducted, persons A, B, C and D wandered around with the intention of robbing and raping a local woman. The group had a history of gang rape and had recently kidnapped and raped another girl, but they released her. Junko had just finished a shift at work at 8.30pm when she was cycling home. Person A instructed person C to go kick her off her bike and then run off. Person A then approached her and offered to walk her home safely and she accepted. He led her to a warehouse and he told her about his connection with the Yakuza. 
He then raped her and took her to a hotel where he raped her again and threatened to kill her. Person A then rang persons B, C and D and bragged about the rape. The group arranged to meet at a nearby park at around 3am. They discovered her home address by going through her personal belongings that were in her bag. They warned her that Yakuza members would kill her family if she attempted to escape. So the four then took her to person A's house and gang raped her. The house belonged to his parents. Junko's parents did report her missing to the police. However, the group then forced her to ring her parents and tell them that she'd run away. Obviously, she was afraid for her family's life and so she did as she was instructed to do. She was held captive at the house and then she was forced to act as A's girlfriend whenever his parents were around. However, they soon dropped that act when it became clear that the parents wouldn't report the boys. They knew that his parents knew about his Yakuza connections and they were afraid of him. He'd been violent towards them in the past. Over the course of the first 20 days, the four shaved their pubic hair, forced her to dance to music while she was naked and masturbate in front of them. And they even left her on the balcony in the middle of the night with very little clothing. They inserted objects into her vagina and her anus, including a lip match, a metal rod and a bottle. They force fed her with large amounts of alcohol, milk and water. She was also forced to smoke multiple cigarettes at once and inhale paint thinner. In one incident, person A repeatedly burned for Tora's legs and arms with a lighter fluid. More than a hundred men are believed to have raped her during her time in captivity. She's reported to have gone through 500 rapes. At one point, she was raped by 12 men in one day. These men often enjoyed urinating on her. Because of all of the trauma to her genitals and her anus, she became incontinent. By the end of December, Fatora was severely malnourished and being fed only small amounts of food and eventually only milk. She was forced to drink her own urine and eat cockroaches. Due to her severe injuries and infected burns, she became unable to walk down the stairs to the toilet and became confined to the floor of Mianto's room in a state of extreme weakness. Other injuries that she had by the other um, torturers was that they ripped off her left nipple with pliers and she was often hung from the ceiling and used as a punching bag. They inserted a hot bulb into her vagina and rubbed it until it exploded. They would insert scissors and lit fireworks into her anus and vagina. Soon, Vittora couldn't breathe through her nose due to the accumulation of blood in her cavities and she received severe beatings throughout. Her damaged internal organs refused to accept food and she vomited many times which enraged her perpetrators for soiling the carpet. Because of this, they used to beat her more severely then. Junko Furuta begged her captors many a time for them to kill her and it was the only thing that they didn't do to that poor girl. Yunko's appearance was drastically altered from the brutality of the attacks. Her face was so swollen that it was difficult to make out her facial features. She was severely malnourished because they'd hardly fed her. Her body was also severely crippled. She couldn't walk anymore, so she had that many broken bones, she just couldn't stand up anymore. Because of all of the infected wounds, her skin gave off a rotten smell that, the four, that caused the four boys to lose sexual interest in her. As a result, the boys kidnapped and gang raped a 19-year-old woman who, like Fruta, was on her way home from work. On the 14th of January, the five of them were playing a game in which the boys lost. That sparked them, to, the boys, to take their anger out on Junko. The group kicked her and punched her. They lit a candle and they dripped hot wax onto her face. They then forced her to drink her own urine. After kicking her, she fell onto a stereo unit and collapsed into a fit of convulsions.
Since she was bleeding profusely and pus was emerging from her infected burns, the four boys covered their hands with plastic bags so that the pus wouldn't get on their hands. They continued to beat her and then they dropped an iron exercise ball onto her stomach several times. They poured lighter fluid onto her thighs, arms, face and stomach and set her on fire again. Fruta allegedly made attempts to put the fire out but gradually became unresponsive. The attack reportedly lasted two hours. Furuto eventually succumbed to her wounds and died. They didn't know that she died until the next day. They wrapped her body in blankets and they shoved her into a travel bag. They then put her body into a 55 gallon drum, filled it with wet concrete and then disposed of it. Welcome back to those of you who skipped ahead. I think that we can all agree that these are extremely sadistic crimes. The four boys clearly didn't have any empathy at all for Yunko. They didn't think of her as an individual. She was a vehicle that allowed them to feel dominant and powerful. The gang members dehumanised Yunko before and during the rapes and the sexual abuse. The four boys had a shared identity and they validated each other. This is what typically happens in gangs. Each member feels an affiliation with the others in that group. They all share group norms and certain acts are considered normal within that group. They validate and encourage each other. Person A is obviously the more dominant one and he shows his level of power on several occasions. The other boys may not have committed a rape on their own. However, because of this group identity and a shared affiliation, they did. They kidnapped and raped a number of women. They do this because of feelings of sexual entitlement and seeking of entertainment. They're thrill seekers. For those of you who listened to uh, the abuse that she endured, it's easy to see that none of them feel any empathy towards her. So I was thinking initially that they could be narcissists or psychopaths because they don't value their victim at all. But what is clear is that these crimes were a show of dominance and power. Person A found that he could intimidate his parents because of his associations with the Yakuza. His parents would have at some point been able to hold the power in their home life. The parents are the ones who set the rules and a child or children must obey and if they don't do as they're asked there are usually consequences for that. But because of these gang associations the power balance changed and the son became the dominant person in the household. Yakuza are well known and well feared in the communities. As soon as you associate with them, you take on their outlook and beliefs. And you do as you're asked to prove that you're worthy of joining that gang. I think that persons B, C and D saw the power and the influence that person A had, so began to take on this group identity, doing certain things or committing certain crimes. He had a social standing that the others wanted and so they looked up to him. They'd gotten away with previous rapes and kidnappings which would have gave them a feeling of invincibility. Obviously they don't value women at all. They saw them as objects that they could do whatever they wanted to. With each kidnap and rape these feelings of power and dominance were validated and shared with one another. They desensitised themselves to violence and rape over time and they worked to lower any of the inhibitions that they might have first had. And that will be a gradual process, that isn't something that happens overnight. There would have been a time where they wouldn't consider punching a girl or dropping metal weights onto her or inserting things inside of a woman simply for their thrill-seeking pleasure. As far as gang rape goes, there has to be a starting point for that too. I suspect that it was person A who first penetrated a female in front of them. It could have been one at a time or all of them at once. It could be that they were encouraged to take part or saw it and became excited by it. They could have been aroused to the point that they wanted to join in.
Again, this is a very gradual process that takes place over time. During all of this, and more so in the final attack, a girl is in front of them, bleeding, begging them to stop, bruised and battered, but they still carried on. They didn't see her as being anything of value or anyone of value. What was more valuable to them at that point was this shared group identity and gang membership. I wouldn't imagine that there was ever a lot of planning that went into this um, case and more of it was about just acting in the moment, in that situation, and they simply reacted as the time went along. The only point at which they did look to the future was when they knew that she was dead. Of course, they wouldn't have wanted to be caught doing this, and that's when they had to put a plan together to dispose of her body. Yunko's body had become infected. She was incontinent. She was battered and bruised, and her face was very swollen at that point. They kidnapped and raped another attractive 19-year-old girl. These women were simply items that were there to do whatever the men wanted them to do. They were vehicles that enabled them to show power, dominance and control over them. This power, dominance and control was part of the Yaku's identity and norms. So in doing these things to the girls, they're sharing that group identity. One of them told his brother what was going on and he told his parents who called the police. However, when the police spoke to A's parents, they said that everything was fine and so the police left. Person A and B were arrested for the gang rape of a 19-year-old girl. The police had information about a double murder that was actually unrelated to Yunko's case. In fact, nobody even knew that she was missing because she'd called her parents and told them that she'd run away. The police implied that person A had murdered the two victims in that case. He said yes, he had. He thought that person B had confessed to the murder and mistakenly confessed to Junko's murder. Person A then told the police where her body could be found. The police found the drum containing Fruita's body. They were able to identify her via her fingerprints. The other culprits involved were then also arrested. In conclusion then, this is a really sad case of a beautiful, kind, caring, fun-loving woman who'd been beaten, raped and murdered. These monsters don't reserve any recognition or acknowledgement. This is possibly the worst crime I've ever come across. All of the psychology behind this lays in the dynamics of group interaction and gang association. They developed their thrill-seeking and sadistic tendencies as they went along. Today's video has been a bit of a long one with much more description of the crime that I would normally include. However, as I said at the beginning, including it allows you to have more of an insight into this case and into the offender's behaviour. Don't forget that you can head over to my website and take a look at the offender profiling courses that I run. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this. Bye for now.